Hello. <laughs> Hello. Watch that. <the> <laughs> Hello. Hello there. Hello. 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 Anybody there? Hello. Tonight, as a special treat, I bring you impersonations. Richard Dreyfus. I don't like the panties drawing on the line. Orson Welles. <laughs> Pretty good, huh? <laughs> we as artists have the responsibility to keep the community engaged through social media to the best of our abilities and share previously unseen and new work. Tonight, Tonight I host a live 30-minute premiere screening of The Witches of Salem a spectacle pantomime dance attraction first performed in 2016 in association with Judson Arts Wednesdays and Bailout Theater at historic Judson Memorial Church in New York City. Please enjoy. In 1692, the Massachusetts Bay Colony executed 14 women, five men, and two dogs for witchcraft. The sorcery materialized in January. The first hanging took place in June, the last in September. A stark, stunned silence followed. The 17th century sky was crow black, pitch black, viable black. The wilderness qualified as a sort of devil's den since the time of Moses, the prince of darkness had thrived there. He was hardly pleased to be displaced by a convoy of Puritans. He was in fact stark raving, mad about it. During the Arctic winter of 1691, the Reverend Samuel Paris preached to a chorus of rattling coughs and sniffles to the shuffling of cruelly frostbidden feet. For everyone's comfort, he curtailed his afternoon sermon. It was too cold to go on. Weeks later, word got out that something was grievously wrong in the Paris household. The minister's niece, Abigail Williams, and daughter Betty complained of bites and pinches by invisible agents. They launched into foolish, ridiculous speeches. Their bodies shuddered and spun. They went limp, spasmodically, rigid, and fell into trances. Betty's father tried prayer and some home remedies as a cure, but nothing worked. He called in Salem's one practicing physician 
William Griggs, whose surgical arsenal consisted of lances, razors, and saws. His own grandniece, Elizabeth Hubbard, also began to shudder and choke. Griggs examined all three girls, but found it difficult to key in on an exact cure. He arrived at the conclusion that it was the evil hand. The supernatural explanation was already the one on the street. Rumors began to circulate that there is witchcraft in the town. Abigail, Bed Betty, and Elizabeth began to name people as witches in order to divert suspicion from themselves. It could be wise to name names before anyone mentioned yours. It was safer to be afflicted than accused. Many braced for a knock on the door. Children, be afraid of going prayerless to bed, lest the devil be your bedfellow. What constituted sufficient proof of witchcraft? Father and son, Increase and Cotton Mather disagreed. Increase explained in cases that a free and voluntary confession remained the gold standard. When credible men and women could attest to these things, the evidence was sound. He had no patience for the muling teenage girls. One did not accept testimony from a distracted person or of a possessed person in a case of murder, theft, felony of any sort, then neither may we do in the case of witchcraft. He casts a vote for clemency. It was better that 10 suspected witches should escape than that one innocent person should be condemned. With a sweeping nevertheless, a word that figured in every 1692 Cotton Mather statement on witchcraft, he then executed an about face, having advised exquisite caution, he endorsed a speedy and vigorous prosecution. The new Massachusetts governor Sir William Phipps established a special court to try the witchcraft cases. As the court of Oyer and Terminer was beginning to hear the cases of suspected witchcraft, Increase's Cotton's son wrote a letter which urged Cotton's caution but failed to denounce the use of spectral evidence. Increase Mather made a number of sermons interpreted as a plea to cool the heated atmosphere. At its head, he installed his lieutenant governor, 60-year-old bachelor and shapeshifter, William Stoughton. 
the young girls asserted they had been bitten, pinched, and otherwise abused. They would have fits in which their bodies would appear to involuntary convulse, their eyes rolling in the back of their heads and their mouths hanging open. When Reverend Paris asked, who torments you? The girls eventually shouted out the names of three townspeople, Tichaba, Sarah Good, and Sarah Osborne. As a slave with no social standing, money, or personal property in the community, Tichaba had nothing to lose by confessing to the crime and probably knew that a confession could save her life. At first, Tichaba denied she had anything to do with witchcraft, but Samuel Paris beat her until she confessed to helping make a witch cake. Such a cake was made from the rye flour and the urine of the afflicted girls. It was argued that the grain had been contaminated with a fungus called ergot, which may have caused some of the symptoms. At the end, Tichaba recanted her confession, admitting that she had lied to protect herself. She was found guilty, not guilty due to lack of evidence. In early March, Mary Warren, the indentured servant of John and Elizabeth Proctor, began having fits, claiming that she saw the ghost of Giles Corey. Warren was kept hard at work and was told that if she ran into fire or water during one of her fits, she would not be rescued. The other girls became angry with Mary and began accusing her of being a witch because she had told the high court that all the girls were lying, that they saw the devil. William Stoughton said, Mary Warren, you stand here charged with sundry acts of witchcraft. What do you say for yourself? Are you guilty or not? I am innocent. Throughout Stoughton's examination, she continually fell into fits, which often follow the fits of the other girls. Mary Warman's testimony did more than save her life. It also represented a turning point in the trials. For the first time, fraud was introduced, yet the judge made no move to aid the innocent, and he continued to encourage the accusers. This action turned the other afflicted girls against Warren and even caused them to suspect she had fallen in league with the devil. Warren's fits returned, and she joined the ongoing witch trials as a witness. Some referred to Warren as a jade, an old-fashioned equivalent to the modern word, bitch. The trial of Bridget, Bridget Bishop opened in Salem uh, uh, in June. The prevailing lunacy of the afflicted girls counted heavily against her, stating that the shape of Bishop would pinch, choke, or bite them. Her freedom from the austerity of Puritan manners and disregard of conventional decorum in her conversation and conduct brought her into disrepute and the tongue of gossip 
was generally loosened against her. Bridget Bishop was predoomed by popular opinion and prejudice. Any time Bridget Bishop would look upon one of those supposed to be tortured by her, they would immediately be struck down and only her touch would revive them. During her sentencing, a jury found a third nipple on Bishop, a sure sign of witchcraft. But upon a second examination, the nipple was not found. Bridget Bishop was taken to the execution site at Gallows Hill and hanged. Perhaps a case of mistaken identity and dressed in very provocative clothing, she cried out, I never saw these persons before, and I never was in this place before. Where will the devil show malice but where he is hated, and hated most? Sarah Good was a prime target for the accusation of witchcraft in the small Puritan-run town where nonconformity was frowned upon. Filthy, bad-tempered, and strangely detached from the rest of the village, she would wander door to door asking for charity. If the resident refused, Good would walk away muttering under her breath. Although she maintained that at the first of the trial, she was only saying the Ten Commandments. Those who turned her away later said she was chanting curses in revenge. When she was asked to say the commandments after the trial, she could not recite a single one. When she was brought in, the accusers immediately began to rock back and forth and moan. Good never confessed to being a witch. Good was pregnant at the time of her arrest and gave birth to an infant in her cell in the jail at Ipswich. The infant died before her mother was hanged. Local officials brought Good to Callows Hill in July, along with Rebecca Nurse, Susanna Martin, Elizabeth Howe, and Sarah Wilds. Sarah Good stood on the platform with the other woman and said, you are a liar. I am no more a witch than you are a wizard. And if you take my life, God will give you blood to drink. The demonic mastermind was a minister named George Burroughs. Burroughs Specter had been terrifying villagers since April, when he first choked Betty, the daughter of Samuel Paris. He nearly tore her to pieces bragging afterwards that he outranked a wizard. He was a conjurer. Days later, he introduced himself with the same credentials to Paris's niece, Abigail Williams, with whom he also bewitched. The girls delivered up their own reports with difficulty, failing into a testimony-stopping trances, yelping that Burroughs bit them. They displayed their wounds for Sheriff George Corwin, who interpreted the minister's mouth, inspected it. The imprints matched perfectly. Justice Stoughton appeared to the defendant. What, he asked, did Burroughs think throttled them? The minister replied, he assumed that it was the devil. How comes the devil than to be so loath to have any testimony borne against you? Stoughton challenged. It left Burroughs without an answer. 
out of excuses, Burroughs extracted a paper from his pocket. Reading from the paper, he asserted that there neither are nor ever were witches, that having made a compact with the devil, can send the devil to torment other people at a distance. It was the most objectable thing he could have suggested. If diabolical contacts did not exist, if the devil could not subcontract out his work to witches, the court of Oyer and Terminer had sent six innocents to their death. A tussle ensued. Stoughton recognized the lines at once. Burroughs had them lifted from the work of Thomas Addy. Addy believed that witches were a convenient excuse for the ignorant physician. The audience in mid-August realized that if a Puritan minister could hang for witchcraft, then no one was safe. Burroughs appeared to have climbed the ladder first, followed by Martha Carrier, John Willard, George Jacobs, and John Proctor. Burroughs entrusted himself to the Almighty. Tears rolled down cheeks all around before he concluded with some disquieting lines. Burroughs began with a blunder-free recitation of the Lord's Prayer, an impossible feat for a wizard. For a few moments, it seemed as if the crowd would obstruct the execution. George Burroughs was condemned for his gifts. The protests quieted, as did the minister hanging in midair. The life had not gone out from his body when Cotton Mather pressed forward to smother the sparks of disrespect and discontent he reminded the spectators that Burroughs had never been ordained. What better disguise might the devil choose on such an occasion, Mather challenged, than to masquerade as an angel of light. Giles Corey was accused of witchcraft along with his wife, Martha Corey, he was a prosperous landowning farmer. When the witch trials began, there were some of the first people to attend the examinations, but Martha soon expressed her doubts about the legitimacy of the claims. When he tried to attend another examination, she tried to persuade him not to, and even hit his saddle so he couldn't ride his horse to the examination. This apparently made her look suspicious to others, as if she were working with the witches to stop or impede the trials. He was arrested in April, along with Mary Warren, claiming she saw the ghost of Giles Corey. So did the village doctor's grandniece, Elizabeth Hubbard, who testified that a creature had followed her home from an errand through the snow and she realized it had not been a wolf at all, but the specter of Giles Corey. Corey refused to plead guilty or not guilty, was committed to jail, and subsequently arraigned at the September sitting of the court. As a result of his refusal to plead in September, Sheriff George Corwin led Corey to a pit in an open field beside the jail. He wisely took the preliminary precaution to deed all his land into the possession of his sons-in-law. In the event Sheriff Corwin attempted to seize the Corey estate illegally 
as he had done with the property of several other victims. According to the law at the time, a person who refused to plead could not be tried. To avoid persons cheating justice, the legal remedy for refusing to plead was bien forte et dur. This was the process of being pressed. It was of no use to expect Corey to yield. That there could be but one way of ending the matter and that Sheriff Corwin might as well pile on the rocks. Corey urged Sheriff Corwin to increase the weight that was crushing him. As his body yielded to the pressure, his tongue protruded to his mouth, from his mouth. After two days, Corey was asked three times by Sheriff Corwin to plead innocent or guilty to witchcraft. Each time he replied, more weight. He placed a curse on Salem and its sheriff during his torture by shouting, damn you, I curse you in Salem before he called out, more weight, and died. Church documents argued that he was either guilty of witchcraft or suicide due to his choice to endure lethal torture rather than enter a plea. The magistrate urged Martha Corey to find God's mercy by confessing, but she refused. He also asked her why her husband's saddle when he tried to attend the previous examination. She responded, I did not know that it would be to any benefit, to which someone in the court shouted, she didn't want to help pine witches. The afflicted girls also contributed to the chaos of Martha's Corey's examination by having fits every time Martha turned her head. At the end of the examination, Martha Corey was indicted on two counts of witchcraft. Most of the afflicted girl's testimony consisted of more stories about spectral visions. Martha Corey pinching, choking, and biting them. Martha Corey kept a brave face throughout this. Martha Corey, the reputed witch, seated among the pious, such a funtry and unparalleled. There was a nemesis in the community, dressed in her Sunday best, taking part in divine worship, and there was nothing anyone can do about it. Martha was still a de facto witch. In September, Martha was brought in to the execution site at Gallows Hill and executed, along with seven other convicted witches. Twenty persons had been executed, and the accusations of the arrests continued from the afflicted, including charges against many high-profile individuals, allegedly including Governor Phipps and Increase Mather's own wives. At that point, Phipps finally let it be known that the court and Oyer and Terminer must fall. A new court was formed with instructions to entirely disregard spectral evidence. But Stoughton was once again selected by his peers to be Chief Justice. In late January 1693, Stoughton ordered eight graves dug in advance of his next round of execution orders, not realizing that Phipps would no longer be appeasing him. All eight were cleared. These were the last hangings of the Salem Witch Trials. Shortly thereafter, the court banned spectral evidence, making the most of witchcraft accusations baseless, and the trials began to die down until they officially came to an end when the last prisoners were released 
in May of 1693. The witches disappeared, but witch hunting in America did not. Each generation must learn the lessons of history or risk repeating its mistakes. The witch trials were an example of hysteria when people can experience when faced with fear. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you for Judson Memorial Church for hosting me again for the last three years in October. Thank you for my fabulous cast and crew tonight. Uh, I don't want you guys to leave. Stick around. We have an hour of magical, magical entertainment for you. And give us a few minutes while we strike the set. Be one to help doing that. Help strike the set and set up for the blue hour. <laughs> <laughs>